Okay, so welcome everybody. Today we have Glaucia Murta. Glaucia is right now in Dusseldorf in her uh, postdoc. I, I don't know actually which postdoc now, maybe the, the, the third or the fourth, like I, I cannot remember, Glaucia. Thank <laughs> and today she's going to talk about self-testing with dishonest parties in uh, device independent entanglement and certification in quantum networks. Okay, Glaucia, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the screen is yours. You have 45 minutes. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, many thanks for the invitation. Big pleasure to speak to the group who uh, are experts on self-testing. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm going to present this this work. The title is Self-Testing with Dishonest Parties and Device Independent Entanglement Certification in Quantum Networks. I hope the title will be uh, very clear by the end of the talk. And this is a joint work that we recently put on archive uh, together with Flavio Bacari. Um, yeah, so first I will start motivating why we introduced this, uh, this scenario, this device independent scenario and self-testing. Um, and then I will uh, state a bit uh, our results and discuss some uh, perspectives and open questions. Yeah, so uh, the motivation comes from, um, from quantum cryptography and network protocols. So the, one of the cryptographic tasks that we are quite used to investigating in the quantum domain is uh, secure communication. So we have like UKD where you have Alice and Bob, they want to establish a secret key. Or we can also have, um, for example, a generalization to the many parties where actually Alice wants to send a common message to Bob and Charlie. So we have uh, many parties. For both of these tasks, Entanglement is a well, it's a necessary resource to, to perform this task and then achieve like unconditional security, um, information theoretical security. Uh, but uh, actually, depending on how paranoid we are about the implementation of these protocols, we can we can have different adversarial levels. So for example, we can say that, uh, well, the minimum where we say that we have a source that distributes the state and we don't know which state exactly the source is distributing. Uh, and in particular, the source can be correlated with the eavesdropper that is trying to get information. Uh, but we can also start relax relaxing some assumptions on the devices and on the measurements that the, the parties are performing. So for example, we can have device independent scenario or intermediate case where we are exploring steering. Um, or even measurement device independent scenarios. So for, for all of these protocols, the parts, they are interested in collaborating. So Alice and Bob, they both want to establish the secret key. So uh, they both will perform all the necessary uh, steps in order to achieve this goal. Uh, so basically here, we can say that we are interested in uh, certifying entanglement with different levels of trust on the source and on the devices that the, the parties are, are using for the, the protocol. Uh, but uh, quantum cryptography doesn't stop in secure communication and we can, we can talk about more complicated protocols. So here I'm giving uh, two examples. So here on the left, uh, we have like secret sharing where I, I have Alice. I hope you can see my mouse moving. Uh, yes, we can. We, yeah. Good. So we have Alice who wants to distribute the information about a quantum state to a network. Uh, so for example, here we have four parties in such a way that uh, subgroups of these parties should not be able to reconstruct the state. So for example, here in, in red, I'm uh, illustrating that perhaps these two parties, they are dishonest, but they shouldn't be able to recover information about this, uh, this site. Here on the, on the right is another cryptographic task where here, the goal is we have a network, we have a sender who wishes to uh, send a quantum state to a receiver in such a way that their identities are not revealed. So here would be like secure communication, but also anonymous on, on top of that. So everyone in the network would have to collaborate for this to happen. But at the end of the protocol, uh, these other parties who did not participate, they wouldn't know who are the sender and who are the receivers. 
So these are, for example, are two examples of cryptographic tasks where I cannot uh, have the same statement that I had before that all the parties are interested in collaborating for the prot protocol to succeed because in both of these protocols, there is some information that is potentially hidden by some of these parties. And therefore, if they are malicious, they might try to obtain this information. Uh, so in this case, we, we would be interested in, in verifying the states that distributed in the network in the presence of an unknown subset of dishonest parties. So here I want to mention some, uh, some previous work in this direction that has been done before in the device dependent scenario, so where the devices are characterized. So basically I can say that, uh, let's consider that we have a network with N nodes and uh, a subset of these nodes is considered honest. So they will just follow all the specifications of the protocol, but there is a subset of nodes that is dishonest. And this dishonest set could in particular come together, perform a joint quantum operation on the, on the, the systems that they have. So uh, then uh, in the first paper that is uh, from Anna Papa and collaborators that they introduced this task of entanglement verification in the presence of dishonest parties, the figure of merit here was actually the distance of the state row that was distributed in the network to a multipartite, to an n-partite JZ state. But since we have uh, dishonest parties here, actually, we, we, have to, we have to allow that uh, these parties could perform a, uh, an arbitrary operation on their system. So here I have identity on the, uh, on the honest set and uh, an arbitrary operation on, on the dishonest set. So basically we can say that we can only certify the state up to this global operation on the dishonest parties. Uh, therefore, I, 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 there is no way that I could remove this the presence of this map here as we cannot guarantee that the parties are not performing it. Uh, but this type, of, uh, this type of statement of verification was, for example, sufficient to lift the security of anonymous communication protocol to the untrusted source scenario. So the, the protocol that I gave the example, this one on the right, uh, there, there was a protocol for that where firstly it was assumed that the source were distributing a JZ state, but now with this type of uh, verification protocols, we can just say that uh, we don't need to assume that. Instead, we can verify that the source distributes the JZ state up to this global operation on the dishonest set. Uh, and then subsequent, subsequent work in this direction, uh, people also looked at a, a different figure of merit. Here is the fidelity with the JZ state. Uh, meaning that if the fidelity is higher than half, I have a, a genuine multipartite entanglement. And again, here I need to have this uh, freedom of operation on the dishonest set. And uh, more recently, this, uh, this type of verification protocols has been even extended to, to graph states. So uh, now the question Rosa, that Rosa, I can, also, can I have a question? Yeah. So there is something I think I misunderstood. So like the set D, which is the set of dishonest parties is kind of known from the beginning. It's fixed from the beginning, but it doesn't have to be known. So the, the statement would be for whatever set is dishonest, this ah, is yeah, the exactly, type exactly. of uh, statement. Okay, okay. And then like uh, the last point is that it's uh, it says extension to graph state, but which graph state actually? I mean, it's, uh, to all graph I states or? I think it's all graph states, if I'm not mistaken. No, then you cannot measure the fidelity with the GAZ state. Okay. Ah, sorry, no, then it's the fidelity with the graph state. Oh, okay. Not, uh, yeah, okay. so, so just uh, it's a verification of uh, graph states. Because, because mm -hmm. both of these protocols, sorry, these first protocols, they are basically based on stabilizers of the GZ state. So basically here is an extension for, for, mm -hmm. all the, for verifying all the graph states, yes. You so, just should adapt the figure of merits accordingly. Okay, and do, do you know by chance this this number here? I mean, this one half. So the one half is for the uh, for the GAZ state, I guess. But yeah. For the other graph states, it's uh, you don't know, no. For the no, I don't know. And okay, I I don't know this work so well, so I'm not sure if they consider fidelity or if they restrict to this uh, figure of merit mm -hmm. of the distance here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the question I, I, I want to ask here is, uh, okay, can we do this, this verification, this certification also in the device independent scenario? So on top of having this 
a set of dishonest parts that could collaborate. I also want to remove the trust that I have in the measurements that uh, in the measurement devices of the honest parties, for example. Um, okay, so in order to do that, I, I need to have a bell inequality and the bell inequality that we use in our work is uh, quite old. So it's a, a family of uh, n partite inequalities. So here I have n parties. Each party has two inputs and two outputs. Uh, and this inequality was uh, introduced by Svetlishny uh, in this work. So 87 for the first time and afterwards general for three parties and afterwards generalized for n parties. Uh, so basically, I mean, I, I, I'm just going to say a few uh, properties of this inequality. So it's a full correlator inequality. So it basically only depends on the value of that they can achieve depends on the parity of the outcomes of the parties. Uh, so basically, it's a full correlator bearing inequality with this, uh, this coefficients here. And the, these correlators are, are basically the probability that uh, the outcomes have parity zero minus the probability that the outcomes have parity one. Uh, so these inequalities, they are well characterized. So they have a local bound and a quantum bound. But I want to comment a little bit on the on the local bound. Uh, well, actually, uh, <laughs> the local bound for genuine multipartite non-locality. So uh, this value here that uh, bounds uh, two to the power of n minus one is satisfied by all probability distributions that can be written as I have a hidden variable model where I can decompose my probability distributions into a factorized probability of different uh, uh, partitions of my set. Um, so yeah, so basically here I, I have a, a joint probability uh, uh, arbitrary in this case for the, the, the parties that are in the set P and here is the probability of the parties in the complement. So actually, uh, so these inequalities were introduced by Svetlishny to capture the concept of genuine multipartite non-locality. So I don't only want to factorize all my uh, probability distribution, but instead I, I even want to allow for combinations of, uh, uh, let's say, by local, by, by local is a bad term to say right now, but uh, probabilities that factorize between uh, two subsets. Uh, and moreover, maybe it's something that's quite important for this inequality specifically. So Svetlishny didn't uh, assume any anything about the form of these, uh, these two probabilities here. So they could be arbitrary, they could be even signaling. So nowadays, this uh, definition of genuine multipartite non-locality is not so, so much used anymore because uh, later works, People show that actually, if you allow for these uh, probabilities to be arbitrary, you have some problems of inconsistencies when you try to, to make a general uh, operational framework of non locality. So, like, do um, wirings and defining what operations you can do on boxes. Uh, and, and instead, you need to assume some things about this probability. So, either that they are non signaling or they could be signaling from uh, one direction or the other direction, but not arbitrarily non signaling. Uh, however, for this specific scenario that uh, of networks where I actually want to model the fact that dishonest parts could apply a arbitrary joint operation, uh, it seems to me that this is exactly the concept that uh, I would need here. Uh, and, and just a side comment, so by, because of this definition of the local bound that it's uh, based on the factorization of uh, probabilities of two sets, we can also infer that if I have a violation of the Svetlishn inequality, I'm detecting genuine multipartite entanglement because my state cannot be of the biseparable form. Uh, Okay, but now I, so this is uh, what I said so far is a standard Svetlishn inequality in standard Bell scenario where parts are separated, but now I, I want to, to go back to this uh, network scenario where I have an honest set and a dishonest set. And just from now on for simplification, I would say that I have K minus one, the first K minus one parties are honest and the last uh, N minus K plus one parties, they, they are dishonest ones. Uh, Okay, so, uh, and uh, 
so here in the scenario where I have two inputs and two outputs and this full correlate of bare inequality, what uh, will matter is that I can model the, the measurements that the parties are doing by this observable. So here it's just a, an arbitrary measurement that uh, part I is performing and here is related to the outcome zero minus the outcome one. So I can talk about these correlators. And, uh, but for the dishonest parties, so in principle, they should be doing local measurements, but we cannot, uh, uh, guarantee that so therefore I, I have to map the action of the dishonest parts to a joint uh, uh, global measurement. So here I can define this uh, global observable where here I'm summing all the possible joint measurements that they are performing corresponding to the part of their outcome being zero minus the sum of all the possible joint measurements that they could be performing corresponding to the parity of the outcome being one. So these will be the effective observables that these uh, dishonest parties would be performing. Uh, and now let's uh, let's see what this. Uh... One second, can I have a question again? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, so you're saying that the the most general uh, action that they can do, like this this dishonest parties, is a global measurement that has two outcomes or something like this. So. I, I could, uh, I mean, the, the global measurement doesn't have two outcomes. So here I could model. So this is the P of M element corresponding to the measurement labeled by this string that they receive mm -hmm. and to the outcome that is this string of outcome. Because in the game, they will be asked, please give me an outcome and they have to give outcome AKN. So the outcome is a string of outcomes. So I'm not saying that it's only two measurements, but I'm just associating this uh, observable where here I sum over all the POVM elements corresponding to strings that have uh, um, parity zero. Um, yes, okay, but in the end, like this M looks like, a, so M is, is what? It's, a, it's an observable, no? So M is a binary observable, yes. Exactly, so I mean, if you construct it like this, it has two outcomes in the end. Oh, there is something I don't get here. No, it, it, that's true. So the, the M is a, to outcome observable and but this is because of the inequality that only depends on the parity of the outcomes so basically it only yes. depends on two outcomes so but, but there is nothing else that they can do they, they cannot for instance use some i don't know channel no, to modify the state or, or those kind of things it's, it's just so they, they they can perform only global measurement uh, well here it would be like a I feel like a channel could be included in this POVM action here because it could be a channel purified and so on too. But so for instance, before uh, when you were presenting this uh, methods of certification that are device dependent, you had this this map H, no? It was H, I think. The map M also, yeah. So, but but in that case, it was like a general channel, no? as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. like so here you don't consider this kind of things. Wouldn't a channel POVM be uh, also a channel and a measurement afterwards? I mean, they have to measure because they have to give an outcome they, or they have to do something. They, they need to give the outcome. No, no, this I understand. They have to give an outcome, okay? So your question is if there could be a channel before here. Yeah, whether they can do something else, no? The, so they can because, for example, they could actually have a k-partite state and then first apply a channel and then do the measurement afterwards. Yes, exactly. Yes, but uh, to me, this is all encapsulated in this uh, pure arbitrary joint POVM element. Well, if there is a post direction, I don't think so. No, if if you have a okay, if you have a quantum channel, I agree because it preserves the. The, the measurement, no? but uh, if you if you first perform some measurement to post selection, I'm not so sure. For the global, okay, so a channel you agree because okay, a channel will just map my quantum state into another quantum state, and then afterwards I perform a measurement. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that if you have a channel, uh, it's uh, the dual map is unital, so you can apply it to the measurement. And you just modify the measurement, so it's like again the same thing, no? Because in the end you are performing like another measurement. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure whether this is the most general operation that you can like perform on the state. Okay, I just yeah, okay, maybe we can discuss later because I think uh, I mean 
you will see later some other statements that I think we would be considering a general operation on the state as well. But uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, okay, so uh, then here I would like to just give an example of uh, explicitly this uh, joint measurement up to discussion whether this is the most general thing. But uh, so here is just the tripartite Svetlishin inequality is this inequality with these eight terms. So it's uh, uh, specifically different from the MEMI inequality. Uh, but now, I mean, the scenario that Bob and Charlie, they could be performing a, a, joint, uh, a joint operation. So for that, I will associate these um, global measurements that are, uh, are labeled by the, the, inputs, the, the, the input string of both of them. Uh, so just re rewriting it. And now one can actually recognize that this first row here is basically a CHSH inequality up to some relabeling or some minus sign. And here I have another CHSH inequality. So the argument here is that, okay, so if I obtain a violation S3, this should be, uh, well, lower bounded by the maximum of these two numbers. So there is, in this scenario, there is a CHSH inequality between Alice and the partition Bob and Charlie, where actually the violation is bigger than the violation that I observe for this Vetlishin inequality divided by two. So even though I'm in a tripartite scenario, I could, I could infer that, okay, I actually have a standard bipartite Bell scenario, and I do have a, a lower bound on the violation that this standard bipartite Bell scenario is achieving. Uh, but the Svetlishin inequality is like super symmetric. So if we we have the, the case of uh, K minus one honest parties and uh, the rest of the parties are dishonest. So this is basically an effective k partite scenario, k partite uh, standard Bell scenario of non-communicating parties. And I can also similarly to this uh, trick that was done for the example of S3, we can actually say that, okay, there is an inequality between K parties that is violated by more than, than this amount here. Uh, and this bound is sufficient to say that whenever you have a violation of the n partite inequality, you do have a violation of the k partite uh, bell inequality. So uh, putting in the language of the, the, the certification, I can say that the violation of the n partite Svetlishin inequality is certifying genuine k partite entanglement between the honest parties and uh, the joint set of the dishonest parties. Um, okay, but actually we can, um, so th this was a, a qualitative result about this Vetlishin inequality. And now I would like to go to a more, um, well, quantitative and stronger result, which is the definition of self-testing with dishonest parties. Uh, Can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, like in this T-party example, you are using measurement, uh, like this uh, Bob and Charlie, these two guys, they can make a measurement which is like after post-processing, post no? Like you are, like these guys are post-processing their measurement. Yes. So uh, I'm saying that, for, so, so suppose B0 here is the maximum, that if I would look just at this uh, inequality here, where I'm considering one of the measurements that indeed, I mean, this was modeled like this. Now we, it's an, uh, an open point to discuss whether this is the most general case. But by here, yeah. I'm modeling an arbitrary uh, POVM measurement that they could do on their system, joint POVM. So, so you are assuming that if this inequality is violated, that means Bob and Charlie is doing some quantum measurement? Because if they don't uh, do something useful, then you, you will not be able to violate this inequality. It will be always bounded by two. Yeah, so I'm saying that uh, there, there is a violation of CHSH between Alice and uh, this group of people. So a bipartite scenario, but the bipartite, so here Bob and Charlie are together. 
And then I'm for, for this, I only use two of the measurements that they do, while for the z lesion they have four options of measurements that they could do. But I'm looking at only the statistics of two of these measurements compared to the, the measurement of Alice A0 and A1. And, uh, and saying that, uh, I mean, I, not uh, necessarily Bob and Charlie have to do something quantum entangled measurement on their party, but definitely I need to have entanglement between Alice and the, the rest of the system. Okay. Yes? Yeah, Okay. Sorry, I couldn't hear very well, but so good. Sorry, uh, can I have another question here before yes. we go? Yeah, so you said that uh, the problems with the Svetlichny inequalities do not concern you. Uh, but if I remember correctly, like the, 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 the result there was that you can set a partition and let's say the Svetlichny inequality suggests that like you have like a local correlations, but, 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 but then by wirings, you can kind of induce non-locality in that particular partition because of the structure of probability distributions that are in that decomposition. So this does not concern you because like by measuring quantum states, you will not end up with such probability distributions or, or what is the reason? I would say that here, I'm not getting too far to evaluate the possibility of wirings between these boxes. It would be okay. Like so, so you so you do not allow for wirings for dishonest parties, yeah? I mean, wirings. I would have to be really like I have two separate Svetlishn inequalities. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at so here we are not. Uh, I, I would okay. not be doing that. I have a single Svetlishn inequality that I'm evaluating. Just okay, just a single. Okay, yeah. Yeah, of okay. course, this might. Uh, I, I wouldn't even know how to formulate this question exactly, like uh, how to to formulate this operational framework with these honest parties. But I think this is. Uh, Maybe potentially possible, but then I have no idea if uh, there would be the same problems or not. But here it's mm -hmm. a simple, uh, and I don't want a general operational framework. And also, I'm assuming, I mean, for the crypto, I can assume I have quantum. Yeah. Okay. I'm not doubting that I have quantum. And comp yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Then, okay, then I move to the uh, definition of self-testing with dishonest parties. So the idea here, it would be similarly to extend this definition of self-testing now allowing accounting for this global operation. So if I would have a, a probability distribution and I say that it's self-test uh, a k-partite state. So here I'm again assuming that I have k minus one honest parties and uh, this uh, the rest is dishonest. I don't need to know which subset is it, but I'm just assuming it's fixed. Uh, so this probability distribution self-tests uh, this target state uh, with the dishonest parties. If uh, for all the possible states that are compatible with this probability distribution for some measurements, then I can find isometries for the honest parties and a global isometry for the dishonest parties such that I can actually transform my uh, the states that originated this probability distribution into the target states plus some extra junk state, some extra system. Uh, and then similarly, uh, we could extend this definition also to self-test target measurements. And, uh, and then similarly, I would have the isometries that a part of, I'm doing actually my real measurements on the state Psi, but these isometries bring you to actually the target measurements applied to the target state plus some extra system. So this is basically the self-testing definition, except for these, uh, global channel, global isometry on the dishonest set. Um, and then uh, and given these definitions and uh, the way we treated inequality, we can say that the maximum violation of the n-partite Svetlishn inequality self-tests the k-partite GHZ state between the honest parties and the set of dishonest parties. And actually, we can also extend this to self-test specific measurements as well. 
Uh, now, just to, to give an idea of this proof, uh, it follows very much from the symmetries of the Svetlishin inequality. So, um, I mean, you can group the Svetlishin inequality with uh, fixing the, the measurements of some of the parties in, in many different ways. So here in particular, I'm writing the Svetlishin inequality as a sum of several of these S2 terms. And uh, what are these S2 terms? So here I would say that basically I have a CHSH inequality between A1 and A2, and the rest of the parties have a fixed uh, input. So the sum here concerns uh, different CHSH inequalities for different fixed inputs of the other parties. So I, with this, I have S plus and S minus. Uh, now the second step is then for each of these CHSH terms, we can write uh, the SOS, the sum of squares decomposition that is already known for the CHSH inequality. So here you see that I, I still get all the fixed uh, terms. And then I guess the sum of squares decomposition for actually for SN. And then finally, from, from, from these conditions, we can we basically get the stabilizer conditions for k partite GZ state. So each of these uh, CHSH terms will generate uh, many of these type of, uh, uh, let's say, stabilizing conditions. Uh, so that's uh, more or less the gist of the proof. And uh, maybe just a side remark, because uh, we, are, we are having this uh, um, self-testing with dishonest parties, but actually, I mean, from the proof, you can see that if I have no dishonest parts, if everyone is honest, then we are having a self-test for the n partite with inequality, self-testing the n partite GZ state. Um, okay, so now uh, I just want to phrase this uh, self-testing result in similar lines as the certification results that we I started discussing that uh, were on the previous works. So here I want to say that the maximum violation of the n partite Svetlishin inequality device independently certifies the n partite GZ state in the presence of the dishonest parties. And uh, with that, I basically, I mean that, uh, okay, I, I have my target state, and I can have some uh, local isometries for the honest parties and some global isometry channel for the dishonest parties that basically say that the state that I have is the n partite GZ state uh, plus some junk. Uh, and here we are just using the freedom, like the, the first the self-testing result and the freedom of uh, operations on the dishonest set to bring a k partite uh, state to the n partite case. Um, maybe like a that that is just to phrase similarly as uh, as the previous result that we had that uh, actually I could say that my state was actually close to an n partite GZ state up to a global operation on the dishonest set. Uh, now the next step is uh, to make these uh, all these statements also uh, robust to noise, uh, and for that. Uh, we based on this uh, previous figure of marriage that was introduced by Jed Kanievsky, where he basically, he called it extractability, I think in his works, I will call device independent fidelity. So the self-testing only tells us that we are the GZ state when we have maximum violation, but what can we say about the state when we do not have maximum violation? So basically this function here is uh, the fidelity of my state with the GZ state, maximizing over all possible uh, here local channels on, on, on my state that could bring it to the GZ state. And also taking the infimum over all possible states that would give the violation that I observed. So in that way, I'm device independent because I, I know that if I observe some violation SN, I am sure that I have at least this fidelity here up to some uh, global, some local channels on the, on the parts, uh, up to some local channels, let's say like that. Uh, so yeah, so the infimum here is over the set of states that would lead to, would lead to the observed violation SN and the lambda I here are quantum channels. Uh, and the goal of this uh, 
uh, of the work of Chad was to, okay, we want to bound this quantity and uh, well, maybe to be more simple, we can bound it with some linear bounds. So here would be some uh, coefficients. Uh, here should be n, not k, but okay. Uh, some coefficients f and mu that uh, are specific for this uh, n partite inequality. And in these works, they also introduced this, uh, this method that was called self-testing from operator inequality, which is basically the idea of transforming this, uh, this equation here into an operator inequality. And then once you prove that some operator is positive for specific values of f and mu, you actually have your lower bound. So, uh, to give a little bit more details, so the, the figure of merit that we want to calculate is, uh, is basically this fidelity here. So I actually, I, I can fix, so here I'm maximizing over channels, but I could choose an, a specific type of channel. I can uh, take the R joint of this channel and make it act on the, on the phi here. So basically here, now I have this operator acting on my state rule. I, I can call this operator K. Uh, and I can also see this as a, an operator of the bare inequality acting on the state rule. And here I could see as the identity acting on the state rule. So basically the idea is to transform this into an operator where in this operator here, I will have the freedom of all possible realizations of this bare inequality. So different uh, measurement angles. And uh, once you prove su such an operator inequality, it, val it is valid for all states, and therefore you, you get your, your linear bound here. Um, okay, so this method and uh, in, like in the subsequent works, they also developed some, yeah, some more techniques to, to compute these bounds maybe numerically. Uh, so now I want to extend this part again to account for the dishonest, uh, dishonest parties and then the modification that we need to do is okay I still allow for the local channels for the honest parties but I can I have to allow that the dishonest parties are actually applying this uh, this global channel and here the infinite over the set of states is all possible states that would lead to uh, the violation SN in the presence of the dishonest parties. So at least here, I feel that I'm accounting for potential channels that it could apply on the state before performing the inequality by the fact of these dishonest parties, but again, to, to be discussed uh, later. Uh, okay, and then, uh, yeah, the final result that I want to present is that uh, we, we, we find a, a relation between this, uh, this device independent fidelity with dishonest parties with the, the coefficients that I actually had for the standard scenario. So basically the relation is the following. If I have uh, K minus one honest parties and the rest of the parties are dishonest. So effectively I have a K partite scenario. Uh, then I, I, I can bound this uh, device independent fidelity in the presence of dishonest parties using the same coefficients of the standard Bell scenario here for a K partite scenario. And here is the corresponding uh, violation that I would have for the effective k partite scenario. Uh, so let's say here is abstract. In our paper, we have some uh, numerical results for these uh, coefficients. So they are numeric, but with some analytical conjectures for k equals 3 and 4. So effective scenarios of 3 and 4, like any n can be arbitrary. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm getting to the end. So first I would like to uh, then to summarize what are the work, the results that I presented. So we introduced this framework for device independent entanglement verification with dishonest parties. Uh, and first I talked about this qualitative verification of genuine multipartite entanglements. And then more towards quantitative, we introduced the uh, concept of self-testing with dishonest parties, and then finally discussed the uh, extension to robust certification where I can certify the fidelity. So this was a joint work with F Flavio Bacardi from MPQ. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now just to discuss some outlook. Uh, yeah, okay. 
So uh, I, I said that uh, the Svetlishny definition of multipartite, uh, of genuine multipartite non-locality seems to be uh, quite good to accommodate this, the fact that I'm uh, actually applying, a, allowing the dishonest pass to, to apply a joint operation. So the question now is if it's really necessary for device independent verification with dishonest parties or if it's necessary and sufficient, or if it's like every time I, I have such type of bare inequality, I can find a scenario with dishonest parties that would make sense. Uh, now, actually, my motivation to go to the device independent scenario in this, in this case was actually that all these previous uh, verification protocols that uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that I said they were based on stabilizers of the JZ state and then afterwards extended for graph states. So they are highly based on, on the stabilizer formalism, but I would be very interested in certifying the W state in this scenario. So um, yeah, so maybe now using self-testing ideas that would be possible. So that's really an open point. And uh, Finally, very importantly, that I like to point out. So uh, my motivation was from the cryptographic uh, framework that uh, okay, I need to certify the state, but there is a huge gap from saying oh, I can certify my state either giving you fidelity bounds, uh, closeness in ORM, to actually the epsilons of security proofs that we get in these protocols. And usually this, uh, this translation goes uh, very badly. Uh, for example, I, I mentioned that uh, the protocol of anonymous communication was lifted to the untrusted source scenario, but the noise resistance is, is the same level of the security parameter. And this is very bad. We, in cryptography, we want to have an epsilon security, very small, but still tolerate some finite amount of noise. So, uh, and from all these results that I presented today, they are no close to making such connections. So that's really uh, an important point to really apply such results for cryptography that uh, I also did it as open. And yes, so then I thank you for the attention and the questions. Okay, thank you, Garcia. Let's thank you. Uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, questions during the presentation, but we still have time for more questions. Anybody? So maybe I can okay. ask some questions. Uh -huh. so, okay, you can go. Yeah, so so the first thing is that it seems that the so this this uh, certification method will work only for states that are symmetric, no? That's why you want to. I mean, like the JZ state is good, and so also the W state is good. Yeah. But uh, what if you uh, would like to have a, such a statement for a state which is not symmetric? I mean, for the W, actually, I, I mean, I know for the W that for the task, it's important that it's symmetric for the task of anonymity, for example, it's very important that it's a symmetric state. Mm -hmm. um, but, but here you use the fact that the specific inequality is symmetric. And I guess that you kind of also use the fact that the state is symmetric because in the end, you want to prove that uh, there exists this local channels plus the lambda d, mm -hmm. which acts on the dishonest parties. But you want to prove it like for any possible choices of the dishonest parties. Yes. So in the end, uh, everything has to be symmetric in a way. That's true. But so in terms of the scenario of motivation, I could imagine some scenarios where I, I actually have some some allowed sets to collaborate. So let's say uh, you only suspect that these two sets, so maybe yeah. non-symmetric inequalities could give me some uh, some results on that, but then I would I would really have a, a non-symmetric scenario, but that would make sense as well. Yeah, but I, I don't know of, uh, I mean, I think people didn't study much this type of uh, genuine wood patite non-locality afterwards. Okay, that's true. And by the way, so do you know any inequality that is uh, that would detect like the Svetlichny one would detect genuine non-locality and would be maximally violated by the W state? Uh, no, not uh, not that would detect genuine no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you <laughs> for the moment. Okay, Glossy, I have a question. 
in your in your paper that is available on the in the archive uh in the first figure you put the case for one just one uh, dishonest party and here in you didn't do that uh yes i mean here yes uh well yes. why Because uh, yes, because it would require some more explanation. So some more somehow this bound they are not. Uh, uh, how can I say monotonically? Uh huh. Okay, so actually the one for one dishonest part is below the yellow here. I think something like that. It should be right, but uh, in the in that case it appears above everything. Ah, yes, sorry, it appears above. Yes, sorry. And and I would uh -huh. expect that it would appear actually under the blue one, maybe if they were monotonically. Uh-huh. Um, uh, wait, let me uh, think about it properly. Here I have three dishonest parties. Yes, exactly. So when I have three dishonest parties, in this case, I'm basically certifying a bell pair. When I have two dishonest parties, I'm certifying a tripartite state. When I have one dishonest party, I'm certifying a four-partite state. Mm -hmm. Because of that, intuitively, I would expect that the uh, the certification, I can say, like it's it's the stronger statement. I'm saying I have a four-partite state rather than I, I have a bell pair. A four-partite JZ is also a bell pair, let's say. Uh, so because of that, I would expect that it would be, yeah, so that the, the D equals uh, one would be actually the lowest curve, but it's not. And then the reason thinking afterwards is from, from the definition of these things. The problem is that uh, when I go from a set of dishonest parts to a different set of dishonest parties, uh, this set here becomes um, the maximum that I'm taking the maximum becomes smaller okay it's horrible to think about mean max but one of them becomes smaller the other becomes bigger so they, they are really not comparable and you can see that from the definition of this expression here ah so the so, curves there in that graph they are not comparable they they are not ordered i'm, I'm saying like uh, not, okay Okay, but then what I can say, what would be my FDID? I would take the minimum over all of them. But I, I, took, I so I didn't put it here because it takes time to <laughs> give all this explanation. And I expected that they would be ordered just by thinking that, okay, when I have only one dishonest party, I really need to have a, a four partite GZ state. But somehow because of this, the way we define this quantity in one case we have a more freedom on the set of states or less freedom on the set of operations uh i mean from the def mathematical definition you can really see that they are not or they have no reason to be ordered yeah uh, okay thank you uh, i think uh, like uh, now i maybe i understand maybe so when you have more dishonest parties the the option you are giving to these parties are like it restricted as you are considering this um, is clubbing them together but if you have only one party the party is one dishonest party the party has more power because the measurement is not a post processing one of the, the previous kind like the kind when you have two parties the power is reducing it is vague but this is happening uh, sorry, I didn't understand very well. Also, because I couldn't hear very well. So you are saying you are still saying about this comparison of the max. I think this comparison is not valid. Like when you have only one part, one dishonest party, because this one dishonest dishonest party can do any measurement. But if you have more than one, you are restricting them by by uh, like what is it, meaning the measurement in the way you are doing like um, this uh, based on this um, function. 
so it's I'm not crazy. restricting them because now they can do also like some um, uh, entangled measurement between the two of them. And before, if I have only one dishonest party, this party can only measure their system. But with two, they can measure jointly their both systems. Yeah, but but that is that in principle that is not a joint mirror. You are collecting the outcome from each parties, and then you are uh, like um, what to say? This kind of feeling that if you have zeros, you are clubbing them in one and making one positive measurement. And if you have one as parity, then you are plugging them to make another positive. But are they positive measurement? Like they are just post positive. They are not global positive measurement. They, 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 I could see them, they could be global positive measurements. And just uh, the way I assign, so I, I have uh, my operator that defines which measurement I'm doing and then how I label it will be the outcome that each of the parties will give explicitly. But the, the POVM itself could be even entangled or so. I am confused also. I was like I was thinking something and I did not recall. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay, in this case I think we can uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glossia. See you in Parachi. Yes, yes. And thanks a lot for the questions. And I will think about this uh, mapping and the generality. If I have something, I write back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. See you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. See you.